Good afternoon. Thank you today for joining us. The Soren Fellows Program at the Janicola Center for Ethics and Culture is thrilled to welcome Professor Dan Philpott to share with us about the book that changed his life, an essay on the development of Christian doctrine by St. John Henry Newman. Professor Philpott is a professor in the Department of, of Political Science here at Notre Dame. A faculty member here since the year 2001, his research, teaching, and academic interests include religion and global politics, transitional justice, reconciliation, and ethics in international relations. Professor Philpott completed his undergraduate education in government and foreign affairs at the University of Virginia, and subsequently went on to earn both master's and doctorate degrees from Harvard University. In addition to teaching, Professor Philpott is the co-director of the Under Caesar's Sword Project, which researches Christian responses to persecution around the globe, and is funded by the Templeton Religion Trust and supported by the Danicola Center. He also has published several, several pieces on the Catholic Church and religion more broadly in global politics. In 2012, he published An Ethic of Political Reconciliation, and most recently in 2019, he published Religious Freedom in Islam, The Fate of a Universal Human Right in the Muslim World Today, both Oxford University Press publications. A long-term long friend of the Janicola Center of Ethics and Culture and the Soren Fellows Program, Professor Philpott serves on the center's faculty advisory committee, has hosted numerous dinners and reading groups in his home, and has supported the center's undergraduate fellows. We're especially grateful to Professor Philpott for joining us this evening to share with us about the book that changed his life. Please join me in welcoming Professor Philpott. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, um, Caroline, for a really nice uh, introduction and for Pete for pulling this together. It's a really neat idea for, for a series and um, it was just exciting to be able to revisit one of my favorite books, uh, made a difference in my, my life and um, it's wonderful to see so many friends and students and familiar faces uh, here. Um, the book that changed my life is uh, John Henry Newman's Essay on the Development of Doctrine. I see you can get a free copy over there. Um, and I chose it um, because it was the single most influential book in my own decision to join the Catholic Church, which I did in uh, Easter 1998. And like Newman, uh, I had been a, a Christian already and was considering the case for the Catholic Church from the standpoint of one who was already a Christian and worshiping in the Anglican communion, like uh, Newman, uh, known as the Episcopal Church uh, here in the United States. And I came to believe that what the Catholic Church proposes is, is true, and on that basis sought to join in um, uh, a full communion. Um, but I wanted to uh, talk then today about um, what did Newman argue that was uh, so compelling uh, to me. In 1801, he was born the eldest of what would be six children in a family that worshiped in the Church of England. He had a conversion experience at the age of 15, after which he was always a strong man of faith. And he began to study Christian doctrine, especially the church of the early centuries, stressing the incarnation and the Trinity. At the age of 23, he became an Anglican priest. And then in his late 20s at Oxford University, he became involved with what is known as the Oxford Movement, which sought to ground the Anglican Church much more firmly in the historic Christian tradition. He would come to argue that it was one of the three branches that formed the one true church, along with Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodox Church. You could also say that he embraced an Anglican middle way between Catholicism and Protestantism, as many Anglicans um, you know, still think of themselves. And it's interesting here to um, think about the um, alternatives. Um, one is what he called uh, Protestantism, and he wanted to distinguish that from Anglicanism, by which he meant the non-Anglican, um, what were called then in England at the time, dissenting churches. They were called that because the Anglican church was the official established church of the realm in England. You remember the, the story, Henry VIII um, and broke off and declared himself supreme head of the church in the early 1530s. And, and ever since then, the Anglican church was the official established church upheld and supported uh, by the government of, of um, England, eventually of the UK. 
And so Protestants, by contrast, were the non-Anglican dissenting churches. They dissented from the official established church, Baptists, Methodists, Puritans, and so forth. But he also wanted to distinguish um, what he believed, even at that time, from what he called liberalism, which was a doctrine from the Enlightenment that stresses the individual as the ultimate determiner of what is true about Christianity. He would later say that he spent his entire life fighting against uh, liberalism. Now, um, as for Anglicanism, he believed that it maintained apostolicity, meaning a continuity with teaching since the time of the apostles. The Catholic Church, he thought, by contrast, uh, like many Anglicans, he held the standard Anglican position, which is that it added dogmas to the tradition that were not authentic. The dogma of transubstantiation, for instance, dating back from 1215. And this was more or less his review, uh, his view prior to his eventual rethinking of it. Even in those early days, though, he was in some ways pricked by the question of the church. In 1833, he toured the Mediterranean with his friend in the Oxford movement, Hurl Froud. And after attending his first mass in Rome, he wrote to his mother, as I looked on and saw the holy sacrament offered up and the blessing given and recollected I was in church, I could only say in very perplexity my own words, how shall I name thee light of the wide west or heinous error seat, unquote. Now, that's wonderful prose. Newman is a very beautiful, beautiful um, stylist. Now, sometimes you have to read his sentences about five times to figure out what he's talking about. But nevertheless, they're very beautiful. And I have a kind of penchant for that uh, 19, beautiful 19th century prose, a kind we don't read anymore in this age of efficiency and conciseness. Well, uh, that question, light of the wide west or heinous error seat, does bespeak a kind of honesty that he had about the question of the church and given its claims to truth. Namely, you had to sort of take it seriously because you couldn't ignore the fact that there was this church that was making big claims. And, you know, not only the kind of claims that that all Christians would make, but a claim to be a sort of authoritative, um, you know, expositor of, of doctrine. And even in the Second Vatican Council document, Lumen Gentium, says the, the fullness of, of truth uh, subsists in the church. So there's a big claim there. You sort of have to think something about it. It's not so unlike what uh, C.S. Lewis argued about Jesus when he said that either he's a lord, um, a lunatic, or a liar. I mean, there's only so many options. It's hard to, unless you want to deny that he existed, and very few would do that. But if you have these claims, you have Jesus who said these things, and we believe that he said these things, well, then you sort of have to make sense out of them one way or another. Well, I think Newman thought the same with the Catholic Church. Here are the claims. You've got to believe something about it. In fact, if it's not the light of the wide west, it probably is a heinous error seat. Maybe it is the whore of Babylon. After all, to make those kind of claims, if, if they turn out not to be true, well, then there's something very problematic. So he took very seriously the kind of sense that you have to confront, um, you know, what is this, uh, what is this thing? Well, <clears throat> late in the 1830s, his studies provoked him when he saw that debates in the early church, and again, he loved the early church, the first centuries, over uh, the natures of Christ were only resolved definitively through the decrees of an ecumenical council of bishops, in this case, the Council of Chalcedon, in 451. Moreover, what he saw and what troubled him was that the Anglican position corresponded to one of the positions that was definitively rejected at that council. And that got him, that kind of provoked him. Well, his doubts grew, and in 1843, um, again, you have to remember, he's part of this Oxford movement. He's part and parcel, one of the key leaders in this kind of movement, and he's at home here. He has all his friends and his community there. But nevertheless, he he takes this question so seriously that in 1853, he withdrew from clerical life and retired to an ascetic life, um, kind of withdrew to write in a study, um, where he sought to work through his thoughts on Christian truth and the development of doctrine, and began writing what became the Essay on the Development of Doctrine, our book. Now, the question of doctrinal development was absolutely central to his quest, where um, were the Catholic doctrines illegitimate accretions, you know, man-made 
additions that came about during the Middle Ages and so forth? Or might they, after all, be authentic developments of the truth revealed to, uh, by Christ to his apostles and recorded in Scripture? So he set forth actually to write this essay as a kind of a self-test. Um, later, he, what I mean by that, he explained later in his autobiography, the Apologia uh, Pro Vita Sua, which he published in 1864. And he said this, my difficulty was this, I had been deceived greatly once. How could I be sure that I was not deceived a second time? I thought myself right then. How was I to be certain that I was right now? I came to the conclusion of writing an essay on doctrinal development. And then if at the end of it, my convictions were not weaker of taking the necessary steps for admission into her fold. Before I got to the end, I resolved to be received, and the book remains in the state in which it was then, unfinished. Well, actually, he did later uh, finish it. Um, uh, the book was still unfinished, though, when he joined the Catholic Church on October 9th, uh, 1845. He had come to conclude that the Catholic Church was one and the same church shared by the fathers of the early centuries, and that the Anglican Church was, in fact, in schism. A second strongly revised version was published in 1878, and that's the version that we, we use now that you would have if you uh, pick up your free copy. Um, now, it is, again, it's important to understand what this meant for him. He was a renowned and beloved Anglican priest, a fixture in the life of Oxford, um, had numerous close friends in the Anglican communion. This was his whole life. Um, he suffered an intense loneliness and ostracism from his decision. Even one of his own sisters refused to speak to him for the rest of his life for making this decision. He was then ordained a priest in the church one year later at the age of 45. And when he was 78, Pope Leo made him a cardinal in recognition of his vast contributions as a theologian. So here's what I'm going to present um, kind of a distillation of, of the argument. Basically kind of a my own sort of reconstruction of the argument in a distilled and brief way, a couple of my own glosses, but basically trying to present it as I, as I see it. Newman's puzzle was this. Over the centuries, Christianity appears to have undergone so many changes that the question arises how far it is the same religion as that preached by the apostles. How to account for these changes that occur over time. In the introduction, he considers several hypotheses. One is Protestantism, that all we need to know can be found in Scripture, which is then interpreted according to the individual. Now, that may or may not be a fair description of Protestantism, but it does uh, re represent one view that he sort of put on, on the menu. And he rejects this approach. A look at history, he, shows, he says, shows that Christians have never actually thought this way. The doctrines that Protestant holds about kind of self-individuals interpreting the scripture are ones that were long swept away if they were ever held. And this is when he has his um, famous line, um, to be deep in history is to, be, is to cease to be Protestant. I, I was, had some friends who I wanted to join the church and I once gave them a coffee cup with that etch, etched on it, Newman's face. <laughs> so they actually did join the church eventually. I don't know, I don't know whether it was because of the cup or, uh, <laughs> uh, or the arguments. But uh, So to elaborate with an example, um, if you take the doctrine of sola scriptura, that we know the truth about the faith only through scripture and not through the authority of the church. Um, this was never really taught until the time of the Reformation. Um, so the argument that is presented as something that is just the way we know Christianity, well, it was only 1,500 years into the tradition that Christians began to think that way, or even longer. Um, and one might add that the doctrine is not in scripture itself, which is kind of a, a problem for the sola scripture idea, kind of a, a self uh, a tension there, internal tension. Now, he gives more a, a consideration to the Anglican alternative. He takes seriously the authority of the historic apostolic teachings, but says that they were clear and were held by a strong consensus um, uh, during the early uh, century. So that's the Anglican claim. The idea that we take his, uh, the historic teaching seriously, but then the claim is that um, you can look back to the early centuries as a time when everybody held them and they, they were clear. They were later corrupted. That's the Anglican view. Um, 
So this view adopts the formula of the early church father, Vincent of Larens, who said that revealed and apostolic teaching is that which has been held, quote, always, everywhere, and by all. And then the, the view is that later, under the Roman church, um, as they would call it, uh, illegitimate accretions were added, like papal supremacy and transubstantiation and so forth. The problem, Newman says, though, is figuring out what was held always everywhere and by all in early times. He shows that there was deep disagreement between major church fathers over the Trinity, purgatory, original sin, and the Eucharist. In fact, there were early fathers who affirmed papal supremacy or purgatory, that which the Anglican church uh, vigorously rejects especially papal supremacy. Anglicans are, differ somewhat over, over purgatory. But the point is there were early fathers who believed that which the Anglican church does in fact reject. The Anglican solution then cannot yield a criterion for authentic doctrines or sort out a diversity of views, despite its claims to adhere to apostolic authority. And so it is here that he proposes his solution, the theory of doctrinal development. Newman's notion of doctrinal development is something very much like this. The Christian revelation was communicated once and for all through Jesus Christ, but could not be comprehended all at once by the recipients and required a long period of time and extensive elaboration over time for its full elucidation. I think of the analogy here as like, if you think of like all the information communicated through God's revelation in Christ, think of that as like a hard drive. And yet, on your screen, you can only have a very small sliver of what is on the hard drive at any one time. So nobody can possibly sort of see all the information on the hard drive and grasp it at once. It has to be unfolded over time. Now, to be clear, Newman very much rejected the idea of a kind of progressive revelation. He affirms the Catholic Church's teaching that God's revelation in Christ is complete and once and for all. He says that the apostles possessed it infallibly. Everything is present in scripture in some sense, but its meaning is so vast that it cannot all be grasped at once. So then he presents to back this up what he calls the antecedent probability argument. Now that may leave you scratching your head a little bit, antecedent probability. Well, let me explain. Again, God's revelation of himself in Jesus Christ is so vast in its meaning and in the information contained in its meaning that no one person or body of people can begin to take it in. It can be viewed from many angles and the whole never grasped. Another analogy would be, imagine a mountain. Now, I, I mean a real mountain, not the little hills around here. The, like a, like a, one of the mountains in the Rockies. And imagine the sort of grandeur of it, but imagine how differently it looks from different vantage points. If you're looking from the peak of a different mountain, it's going to look one way. If you're looking down from the valley and looking up at it, it's going to look very different. If it's light and it's noontime, it's going to look one way. If it's dusk or night, it's going to look a very different way. So it always looks different depending on which angle or which vantage point you see it from. And yet the mountain is an objective reality. It doesn't change. It's not as though there's different things. The thing isn't changing. It's just the way it looks changes. Um, and so that's sort of the idea that no one can sort of grasp the whole. You're always looking at it from one sliver and one angle. Um, I would only add one other idea that I think is implicit in what Newman argued, that in the case of Christian revelation, not only is a vast meaning there, but it is a message to us, information that we are supposed to know and live by. And our knowledge and knowing and living by it is, has a high degree of importance and leads us to salvation. So if there is a revelation, if it cannot be grasped by any one person at any one time, and if it is important to know what it means, at least enough of it to live by, then it is probable that God would steer the development of doctrine in order to unfold the meaning of revelation for us over time as the human mind could handle it. So there's a probability that emerges from the very fact and nature of revelation. Now to this core argument, he adds a couple of buttressing arguments. One is his observation that all Christian sects and churches rely upon doctrinal development. None of them simply teach in some pure and incontestable sense what arises out of scripture. Um, you know, virtually any Protestant church is gonna hold things like the Trinity. Now the doctrine of the Trinity on one hand, it is in scripture. The raw materials of it there are in scripture. But the doctrine didn't unfold and wasn't enunciated until the fourth century. And in fact, there was deep disagreement over what it meant until then. 
So um, virtually all churches, whether they're Catholic or not, in fact, um, rely upon and hold doctrinal development. Moreover, scripture is not self-interpreting. He gives the example of a verse from the Gospel of John, the word became flesh. He says that each of these three words, word, uh, became, and flesh, is subject to profound interpretation and potentially disagreement. Another is Newman's observation that scripture itself unfolded through development. The New Testament develops out of the old, builds on it, is, and is prefigured by its types. The Red Sea crossing, for instance, is a symbol for baptism. So even in scripture itself, the notion of development is already there. You know, we shouldn't be afraid of it. He also he, uh, appeals to the parable of the mustard seed and of the yeast and the leaven from the Gospel of Matthew as a sort of notion that there's kind of a seed there. He loves these organic metaphors that then develops and grows into a plant over time. So his conclusion is that there is a probability that Christian doctrine goes through authentic developments steered by its divine author. Um, and then he adds that there is a further probability that God would provide us with an infallible authority so we know what developments are authentic. The fact of development alone does not tell us which development is authentic. Christians are under biases due to time and place of birth, education, personal attachment, the communities that one is part of. Even the learned theologians cannot agree. It is difficult and next to impossible to come up with some reliable test. I would add that we can then ask, of the many different interpretations offered by many different churches, how are we to know which is the best? A controlled experiment is the Protestant Reformation. Within 10 years of Luther's uh, theses, you had not only Luther, but multiple independent church communities, which differed with one another as much as any of them differed from Rome. This undecidability is reinforced by the fact that the most important of the truths we are talking about is divine revelation. It's not something we could have thought of ourselves or generate from reason alone or even close to it. He also adds that Christianity is a social entity. It's not likely that there's, to be, there's going to be any unity without a single authority over the doctrine. And thus, there is a probability of an infallible teaching authority. What... what, what um, well, what it means that all of this is antecedent, if you add that term to it, what he means by it is that prior to actually looking at the papacy or the magisterium itself or arguments for it, we see that a need for such an authority arises from the character of revelation. That means when, before we look to see if there is in fact a, you know, an authority um, or, or development. It is prior, prior or antecedent to discovering such an authority, we affirm its probability. Now then he goes to the next step of the argument, which is the evidence that what is probable in fact emerged. So we have what is probable based on the nature of revelation. Then we look to see, did such a thing actually then happen? Well, there is the simple fact that the Catholic Church alone manifests and claims this infallibility. Well, we find what is expected. This is confirmed in scripture where 1 Timothy 3.16 calls the church the pillar and ground of truth. Um, to quote Newman, some authority there must be if there is a revelation given, and other authority there is none but she, unquote. The Catholic Church is the only one that maintains a consistency of doctrine from the early church fathers through the Middle Ages through the present time. And he then goes on to show that the development as doctrine is confirmed through actual developments. And Newman gives numerous instances one can see an advance in the direction of doctrines, their definition, and then reasons why they were defined at a particular time. Often say there's a controversy that breaks out and then it needs to be clarified. So it gives the example of the canon of the New Testament, which books are included in the New Testament, the doctrine of original sin, infant baptism, communion in one kind, that you could take communion one kind but not, but not both and still get the full body and blood of, of Christ. Um, consubstantiality, notion that um, uh, the Son and the Father are, are of the same nature, the papal supremacy, the sinlessness of Mary, um, all these things were the result of this process of development that you expect with an antecedent probability and then see that it actually happened in the authentic way. And also he points out that it's, it's also very telling that these doctrines go together and reinforce one another, a remarkable fact that is hard to explain apart from, uh, you know, a kind of supernatural process taking place. Now he then goes on um, 
in the book towards, uh, once you get into the pages 200s and so forth, to um, uh, articulate a number of notes, seven in particular. He calls them notes that distinguish authentic developments from corruptions. Now, these were like signs or characteristics of the doctrines that helped to distinguish or manifest their authenticity. Now, in an earlier version of the writings, he had used the term test, uh, meaning that, um, you know, these were kind of tests for, for the doctrine. But he, he then later backs off that and just calls it notes. I think he means that it's sufficient that a doctrine is taught by the magisterium to have uh, grounds for its authenticity. But nevertheless, there are characteristics of it that bear out its authenticity. So here are the seven uh, notes. First, there is unity of type. Unity of type. <clears throat> this is the most important. And this means the continued presence of an idea despite a change in its external expression. To illustrate, he often in this part of the book uses organic metaphors. Think about a person that uh, you know, Father Dominic looks very different now than he did when he was 15 years old, but he's still the same person. So you can change in appearance and aspect. Um, yeah, I blush when I see some of the pictures of myself uh, when I still had hair, uh, for instance, when I was in college. Um, but yet I'm the same person. And I may lose my hair or have it turn gray or what have you, but I'm the, still the, uh, the, 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 the being is still the same. The same would be true like for a, a tree. I mean, you have it in the acorn, like a, take an oak tree, and then it's, you know, a few years later is a, a sapling, and then you know, a couple decades later, it is a large oak, oak tree that we that we know. But it's still all part of the same organism. Well, the same is true of doctrine; it can change in many different ways, and yet it's always consistent and part of a kind of um, a, a single thing. Second, um, continuity of principles. Now, what he does then is identify nine original principles, and he thinks that doctrine always has a continuity with them. So they are dogma, faith, theology, sacraments, scripture and its mystical interpretation, grace, asceticism, the harm of sin, and the potential of matter to be sanctified. Well, he, th that those nine principles are things which any development is going to be consistent with. Third is the power of assimilation. Uh, uh, authentic doctrine can take on external realities and remain intact. An example would be that the early church um, took on Greek philosophy to explain some of its doctrines, and yet that didn't corrupt it. It was something that it could assimilate and use it to help it. Um, I'm going to illustrate in a minute with the doctrine of religious freedom or dignitatis humanae, which in some sense benefited from a dialogue with the surrounding world. And yet the doctrine was one that was based on the church's uh, teaching. Logical sequence, number four, logical sequence, meaning that it's logically consistent with original teaching. An example would be um, purgatory. So Christ and the apostles originally taught that one must be perfect to get into heaven. And yet we know that many, even people who die in friendship with God are not yet perfect. And so that leads logically to the notion that there's a process of purification that, that takes place. Fifth, anticipation of its future. Now this is similar to the last point, but it really means that we can look back and see the doctrine in an earlier embryonic form in a way that then anticipates the development that would take place. Uh, sixth is conservative action, that authentic development builds on previous developments and clarifies or strengthens them. It does not reverse or contradict them. And then seventh is chronic vigor. Um, authentic development remains robust over time, um, whereas heresies, by contrast, corrupt and disintegrate. So they don't really remain robust. They become very uh, contested and confused. A lot of times they kind of disappear away. Um, that that's lacking in chronic vigor. So that in a nutshell is Newman's argument for the development of doctrine. And I tried to give it in a kind of uh, summary form. What, ex what I'd like to do now is give an example of maybe the most important doctrinal development of modern times, which is um, the doctrine of dignitatis humanae, the teaching of religious freedom, which emerged at the Second Vatican Council. In fact, on December 7th, 1965, right the day before the council ended. So the, the Second Vatican Council declared the, the um, right of the human, natural human right of religious freedom in 1965, saying that it is wrong for anyone to coerce another person in matters of faith, whether that anyone is a government or another party. 
Now this was a departure from previous practice. The church, especially in the high middle ages, had used imprisonment, execution, even torture, or at least handed people over to the state to experience those things. Um, at times, um, you know, had, had used coercion. Um, right up until the council, um, Protestantism was still outlawed in places like Italy and Spain. And in the 1950s, as late as the 1950s, church authorities still argued for the legitimacy of coercion. And yet the council insists that the new teaching, that it's wrong to coerce in matters of religion, um, was, not a, was not in fact a departure from previous doctrine or, or dogma. The council says that it searches diligently the sacred tradition and doctrine of the church from which it brings forth new things which are without exception in harmony with the old. So how is this? How can that be? One thing that's important, and this is, uh, corresponds with Newman's various notes, is that the doctrine of religious freedom was preceded by seeds or elements that had been there since the earliest times. The church had always affirmed the free character of faith, that faith could only be adopted through a free act. Augustine, Aquinas taught that. Um, many councils and bishops had taught that um, and affirmed it, uh, even through the Middle Ages. Church had always taught against forced conversions. Sometimes they happened, but they were always, there was a bishop to step in and say, no, that's not, you know, not what we do. You can't forcibly convert somebody into the faith. The church had long insisted on the um, extreme importance of conscience, that faith had to be lived and chosen out of one's conscience through a free reflective act. And also the church had always taught that there is um, a duty to search for the truth that every person has. And that goes hand in hand with the idea that it must be free when one sees the truth and then adopts it. So then you might ask, well, what was the reason for the coercion if all that was true? Well, usually what, what they argued, right, Thomas Aquinas argued, for instance, that the reason for coercing was, was with respect to a heretic. And then a heretic was a person who was baptized into the faith and then ultimately left it. Um, and you, couldn't, you could coerce a heretic not because through the primary idea that you could force that person into the faith, but rather that that person was damaging the society. Uh, Thomas Aquinas compares heresy to um, counterfeit money, that uh, you know, money destroys the money supply. Um, well, the heretic was likewise um, destroying the spiritual ecology and sort of bringing other people down through his heresy. Now, that doctrine was something that you could coerce the heretic was never something that was dogmatically taught by the church through any council or any kind of deep, enduring official way. It was a political practice and it had a lot of, you know, length and longevity to it. But ultimately it was something that the church could leave behind and say, no, that was not right. But it wasn't changing its dogmatic teaching or it's, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't contradicting previous doctrine that it taught. And it was building upon these other things like the free character of faith, no forced conversions and so forth. So it was, in fact, a development. It was a new thing for a council to teach that all coercion in matters of religion was wrong on the basis of the dignity of the human person. And, and it, in fact, has remained robust. The church has continued to teach it. Popes have continued to affirm it. It's the basis for affirming the rights of um, Christians around the world and all religious people around the world of any faith who um, is coerced or under, living under persecution. So you see a, a development that's something new that, that is made clear over time. Um, and yet um, it, it did change something, but that thing that it changed was um, a political practice. It wasn't a deep uh, dogmatic teaching. And so, so the teaching develops and, and builds on previous elements. And in fact, all developments in the moral teaching or social teaching of the church have this character of being a deepening of prior prohibitions. So there, you can also find developments with respect to slavery, torture, um, as you can res respecting freedom in matters of religion. And in each case, there was some seed that was there before, but the church deepens a prohibition that was already there to make it more robust, more thorough, more absolute than it was before. What you don't see is the church contradicting or reversing something that it had previously taught, you know, through its dogmatic authority. And that's why, you know, some people are hoping that maybe the church would change certain doctrines um, and um, that it's already taught definitively. But that, you know, in Newman's view and the church's view, uh, you know, cannot be expected to happen. 
What we can see is a deepening of a, of a previous prohibition um, in a way that makes it more, um, more purified in a sense. The council fathers themselves um, referred to their declaration as, as a development, um, or at least an expounding upon previous uh, teachings. So um, behind the argument for doctrinal development is an argument for the basis and grounds of unity in the Catholic Church and the basis of the Catholic Church's authority. It may be the key argument that differentiates the Catholic Church from other Christian churches. And for me, in my own uh, development, this was more important than sorting through Pope, the Pope, Mary, Purgatory, or the Eucharist. Once I could accept the church's authority, I could then accept these other things. I wanted to close with um, a quote from the great uh, Catholic novelist, Walker Percy, uh, that I think kind of captures, uh, sums it up, and it's this. He said, this novelist can only observe that if the magisterium and the sacramental orthodoxy of the church are compromised in the name of creative pluralism or such like, there may be a lot of hugging and kissing and good feeling going on, but there won't be any Catholic novelist around. For these odd fellows are turned on precisely by these claims of the church, breathtaking in their singularity and exclusivity, i.e. the magisterium and the Eucharist, and how these have endured with the people of God through these kinds of thicks and thins for 2,000 years. And they will endure despite these chic brush-offs of Rome. Get rid of Rome, and what will be left in the end is California. Thank you. <laughs> Friends, we have some time for questions, if anyone has questions for Professor Philpott. Yeah, Nick. Hey, Professor, how are you? Yes, good. Good to see um, you. Yeah. I was wondering what, uh, I mean, you touched a little bit on the, the reaction that Newman had in his Oxford community. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, your family or your... Oh. Your family. <laughs> church. Have they converted or are they still? <laughs> My family has not converted, but I, I will say they were always very gracious about it and they were always very willing to support me. They understood that this was important where I was going. And so uh, I was never disowned or written out of a will or uh, anything like that. <laughs> and I also want to say I have so many dear friends who are Protestants. I mean, the, the, the argument here is not really about, is not about Protestants. It's about the case for the church. I mean, there are many saintly Protestants and many bad Catholics like, like me. But uh, um, so it's not, it's, you know, it's really about the kind of case for this entity, the, the church. And uh, so I never suffered any major kind of price in a way. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Um, so just a quick question, knowing our current state of the church, especially with Pope Francis and yes. the Amazon kind of synod. Yes all the mysterious things yeah. surrounding that. <laughs> right. um, when it comes to the question of especially, um, so many people saw him to be progressive and pushing for different different things than the church had before, it's including female priests, yes. um, or even the, uh, the, uh, the allowance of married male priests, how would you say that factors into Newman's argument then, um, especially in the modern day, uh, and the idea of if we don't have Rome and rules for going to just have California. Yeah, that's right. Well, um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of arguments about Pope Francis and, you know, whether he's a progressive and that sort of thing. One of the interesting things to me uh, from the Amazon thing is he di didn't seem to endorse any of the kind of changes that um, many were, were wanting. In fact, um, I see that some of the German uh, church had called him a coward, <laughs> clearly sort of indicating they had expected something, something more. But the key thing is, um, you know, is the... Um, I mean, at the very least, um, we expect that the popes will always, especially when they authoritatively teach something, you know, where they're putting the whole force of their authority of their, you know, being the pope behind it. And you'll, that, they often signal this. They'll say by virtue of the See of Peter or something like that. Um, you know, um, I, I can say easily and confidently that Pope Francis has never taught anything that has um, gone against the previous dogmatic uh, teachings of the church. Um, in terms of development, um, if anything is a candidate, it might actually be his teaching on the death penalty. Now, it's not entirely clear what it is, um, but he talked about the death penalty being inadmissible. And, um, and then that, you know, the, the real kind of initial break or, or initial kind of what seemed like might be a development was John Paul II's teaching. And he taught in Evangelium Vitae that the, Evan, that the death penalty should not be adopted in any circumstances. Um, 
you know, where um, the only place where it might be countenanced is if, like, um, say, if you're, uh, the needs of self-defense, like in a prison or something. He said, in modern circumstances, there's no need to record, re recourse for it. Interestingly, though, that teaching almost, because self-defense is different than punishment, right? That almost suggests that maybe he was rejecting the death penalty definitively as a kind of punishment. Now, again, it's not clear, not entirely clear. And so Pope Francis might be uh, uh, hearkening towards a development. He might be teaching consistently with John Paul II. Maybe not. We have to kind of, there's a lot of different interpretations. But he hasn't really sort of authoritatively sort of d defined a, a new teaching. You know, he has issued some statements and so forth that might indicate it. Um, you know, kind of a movement in that direction. But that's, that's like, to me, that's the closest thing I, I can see in Pope Francis that might be, um, you know, a real authentic do doctrinal development. And I don't think he said anything that kind of um, confuses the issue of development. Yes, uh, maybe over here. Oh, sorry. Sorry in advance if this is a kind of too big a question for the Q&A, but when you were talking, I was, um, I was really interested in the idea of an argument for authority from unity, because mm -hmm. I was thinking, well, if you want intellectual unity, then it kind of seems that obviously you do need an authority. Um, but there's other kinds of unity as well, so you could have lots and lots of intellectual disagreement, like in the early church, and go, well, there's some kind of different kind of unity, like we're all I don't know, we're all part of a community or we're all committed to a very, 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 very small set of intellectual principles or something. So I was just kind of yeah. wondering what, what he thinks about that or what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I'm not sure I would uh, orient it around the term intellectual, but rather the notion that revelation is a communication, that God's communication for us at first, but also that it's a communication that is very important for our actual practical action, our, our lives. So it's a communication that is for us, for, you know, for our salvation. So we, um, and that's why it's very important to know the meaning of it and to know what things are, you know, we expected to do. How do we then go about, you know, living that out? And, and also maybe as well, what things are optional and what things are, you know, variable with respect to time and place, which I mean, another kind of error is claiming that something is uh, permanent, which is not, you know, uh, and that, that mistake has been made too. And um, so, um, you know, given the kind of the vastness of revel revelation and the information contained in it, right, and given the importance of it for actual action, um, that, that suggests that it's probably very unlikely that people um, just kind of acting individually or in different uh, Christian communities are going to come to an agreement on their own, right? Um, uh, that, that it suggests that there's a probability that there, there was a need, a need for a single kind of unified authority who, who would teach it. And, um, and, and yeah, I think that that's, I think that, that's the key thing, is sort of the, um, the, the vastness of it, um, the improbability that anyone is, there's going to come to be agreement among people through their own, own processes, but also the importance of having an answer. Now, one might answer, well, you know, maybe what we really is important is just a few things, and then there are other things which they all disagree about, like infant baptism and so forth. Maybe we can disagree about those things, right? But... And, and that's one way of going about it. But the problem is that just kind of pushes it back. Because where do we ever draw the line or know which things are the non-negotiables and then which things are the things that good people can, quote, disagree about, right? Um, you, you know, and then if you want to claim that these are the core non-negotiables, um, well, uh, you know, then how far do you want to kind of trim that down? I mean, what if, what if we start saying that the Trinity is something that could be part of the, um, you know, optionals? Right or um, you know Unitarians want to say, well, why, why the divinity of Christ? And um, I mean, during the early church, all these kind of options were put forth. Massive number of different answers to the question of like the natures of Christ and things that we may take for granted now. Um, so I think if you look at all the different kind of options and ways of stacking it up, the mo the, the best answer I think is the one that Newman offers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yes, two, two questions. Uh, first, uh, thanks for your, for your talk. Uh, who recommended you the book or how you got to, to know the book first? And second, following that question, uh, the thing is uh, that for development to be possible, I think there is need for discussion, prayer, and yes. disagreement. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, for example, the Immaculate Conception, 
to the discussions of immaculate conceptions where many theologians disagree about it. Even yeah. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. So, how what does Newman exactly say, or if he says something about not being afraid to disagree? Yes. And to discuss in order to develop. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it would affirm that. I mean, often that's the way the developments happen is there is a you know, very wide disagreement among theologians. And you know, there's always such disagreement and that, you know, that kind of conversation is to be welcomed. I mean, doctrinal development does not mean a sort of shutting down of conversation. There's always the conversation to take place. Um, in fact, a lot of times the thing that prompts a development is a disagreement or a dispute, right? But um, the argument is that um, the church then does definitively teach certain things and dogmatically teach certain things. And once they are defined, then we can have confidence that that is an authentic understanding of the revelation, right? And that's something for us to then, then follow. But, um, uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a question of um, one can always then entertain, well, you don't think the Immaculate Conception was the right thing to be defined and so forth? I mean, that conversation has to, you know, that dialogue is always con continuing, right? The Second Vatican Council affirmed the importance of that, that dialogue, right? But I think that Catholics can also look at, um, you know, what is dogmatically defined and, and have a confidence that that is an authentic clarification of revelation. Yeah. Did Newman ever witness any or uh, attest to any development of doctrine within the Protestant churches in this correct manner, or did he only see it as a continual division? No, I think he would say there's a lot of commonality, you know, that um, are held, um, you know, a lot of Protestant churches hold on to, you know, some of the key things that were developed in the early church time and the, um, you know, um, you know, the doctrines of the Trinity and the two natures of Christ and so forth. So a lot of, there's, there are going to be a lot of things that are held in common, but there are a lot of divergences as well. And then starting to, you know, sort through those kind of raises the question of, you know, is there something we can have confident that is an authentic, you know, interpreter? Yeah. Uh, do you know if, uh, I guess, during his conversion, um, if he ever considered Eastern Orthodoxy and how his relationship to Eastern Orthodoxy changed from kind of like uh, his consideration of Catholicism? Yeah. Yeah. Like, are there any particular texts that he explicitly refers to mm -hmm. uh, Eastern Orthodoxy? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to it. And I don't know his uh, process of uh, sorting through these things well enough to know that if he could, uh, specifically looked at that. And he looks at lots of doctrines that separate different Christian communities. Um, but, you know, the... Um, yeah, I think that you know the, the main thing that seemed the doctrinal thing that seemed to separate the two churches at the time of the schism was the filioque, and um, the you know the father proceeding from the you know the, the relationship between the members of the Trinity, who proceeds from who, and so forth. But um, yeah, and uh, but I'm not sure if that was one of the things that he kind of really looked at. I don't see it in here, um, but. Um, yeah, it is interesting that you know uh, inter interreligious dialogue or ecumenical dialogue has proceeded in recent years, and there's been substantial agreement on the filioque between the Orthodox Church and Western churches. So there's hope that maybe that can be resolved. But then, you know, then there's always something else that's the problem, right? <laughs> so. so, oh yeah. For you. Um, so, again, unity and continuity are such key principles here for the development of Christian doctrine. Yeah. But I guess my question kind of harkens to a how many grains of sand make a pile kind of thing. Like, um, to what degree do we have to have this sense of unity apparent to us before we can really definitively say the church is developing in this way? Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, so that might get to be like, what are the marks of an infallible doctrine or a uh, dogmatic doctrine? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question, I, and I don't have it right at my fingertips. And in the document um, Lumen Gentium, it gives four marks of infallibility that can be seen as characteristics of those uh, doctrines that are, that are considered um, you know, kind of infallibly uh, pr pr uh, proposed. And... Um, I mean, certainly there are certain things, um, you know, certain, uh, the, the fact that they're taught by an ecumenical council 
or defined, defined at an ecumenical council is usually one good mark and is held to be a kind of taught by the consensus of bishops. There are certain occasions where the Pope can exercise the um, exercises and fallibility by offering an ex cathedra teaching, which means out of his seat. And, but that has only happened a small number of times. Um, you know, like the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception and the um, Assumption. And, um, and uh, so you, you, you look for that universal consensus of bishops. Usually there is some kind of signal where they're signaling it to you or defining it as, you know, one of the dogmatic teachings. Um, you know, in John Paul II's Evangelium Vitae on the Gospel of Life, there's a passage where he says, by the full authority of the See of Peter, I teach that. And I think what he's doing, he's signaling to you that this is, this is a non-negotiable. This is a, you know, this is a kind of, by the Pope, I'm teaching this as, you know, exercising my uh, office and teaching this as an infallible doctrine. And so uh, that's not, a, I don't have a great answer for that, but those are some of the things that I, I would look for. Yeah. As a big fan of Welcome First, I'm a little shame that I don't know where this quote is from. Where does Percy say this? That's a... That's a really good question. I'm not entirely sure. It's, a, it's in my notes, and I don't, I've, I've had it in my notes for many years. It might be in, um, he has a book of essays. Um, I think it's, there's one called like Strangers in a Strange Land, or is that, there, but there's a book of essays where he um, uh, has, a, uh, I, think, I think it comes from that. There's, there's an essay that he once wrote called Why I Am a Catholic. And um, I, think, I think it might be in that where he makes the quip about, uh, about California. <laughs> yeah. So. One more? Yeah. Um, so in your talk, you said that with new developments of doctrine, they can't contradict previous formulations. So how would you adjudicate, or how do you think Newman would adjudicate the apparent contradiction with a uh, syllabus of errors and dignitatis upon it? Oh, yes, yes. Um, that's good. That's a very good question. Um, I just taught this in my uh, Catholicism and politics class. Um, I mean, one of the question is when, when the, the syllabus of errors is a little bit tricky because um, Pope Pius the Ninth is listing a bunch of things that he thinks are errors. So it's like an argument by a negative. So he's saying, don't think this. This is an error. But it's not always clear exactly what le that leaves you open that you c you, sh you can think. And it may, may be deliberate. A lot of times the church is saying. If you think this, it's an error, but it leaves it somewhat open, you know, what the full right, right view is or whether something might evolve. And um, so it's an error 15 that he seems to most, um, that might be thought of as the candidate for contradicting religious freedom. But if you look at it closely, he says um, there is no freedom in matters that the, people don't have the freedom to sort of adopt any religion they want to through the, um, the, the guided use of reason. So maybe what he's really condemning there is a sort of moral freedom by which people can just sort of decide their own truth. And that would actually be compatible with some of the other errors in, in the same document. I and mean, he's concerned about this kind of notion that came out of the Enlightenment that kind of each person's religion is, is their own and one, one's as good as the other. It may be that that's what he's getting at. You know, one can't be sure. And if that's what he's getting at, then Dignitatis Humanae does not teach that which he thought was an error. It teaches something else. I mean, some of the critics of Dignitatis Humanae said, well, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. Error has no rights. But then the response was, we're not teaching that error has no rights. We're teaching that people have rights because they have dignity. And so even if someone is, as the church sees it, in, in error, they still have the right not to be coerced. And so that diff seems different than what uh, Pius IX was teaching against. Friends, please join me in thanking Professor Philpott. <laughs>